and used to drink. And there's a difference. You're not who you used to be. The redemption of God has given you a whole new life, and you're not that former person anymore. You need to quit referring to yourself that way. You've been transformed and made new. And I, I will say more about that. But that's what chapter 2 is about. It's about this idea that God is trying to shape you and make you into something. So a few weeks ago, if you're a social media person, you remember that there was this little thing that was going around on social media when people would post a picture of themselves from 15 or 20, 25 years ago. And then they would post a recent picture, and it was like, how much I have changed. And I thought that was pretty cool. I watched it. And some of you were so crazy that you did that. And I stole your pictures. And they're coming up on the screen. Here's the first picture. See if you can figure out who that is. Go ahead, next. That's me. That's my high school graduation picture. I was 16 years old at the time. Not very much has changed, has it? I'm still the good looking guy I was all the way back there. Although Kylie Martin told me today that I'm not as cute as some of the boys in youth group. So I figured that out already. Next picture. You know who that is? <laughs> Snap the next one. <laughs> there it is. Oh. <laughs> Debbie's not changed, but Gary looks like a whole different person. <laughs> next picture.
that we are his, his people even though we are in great struggle. <clears throat> he says, as living stones are built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Then he says this, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Are you glad for mercy? Yeah. Lift up your hand. Let's pray right now. Father, thank you for what you're about to do in this room today through your word. May it be strong. May you speak into our hearts the things that you desire us to know. May we receive it, Lord, as nutrition to our spiritual man. Quicken and awaken our understanding and help us, Lord, to be alert, to realize just exactly what it is that you are doing in each and every one of us and help us to patiently endure. Knowing, God, that you are performing a work in us that will bring us to the place of your purpose and your destiny. We trust you for that today in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. This is a church that's made up of people who are becoming. We are not what we were, and we are not what we will be, but we are becoming. We're becoming better husbands. We're becoming better spouses, better wives. We're becoming better mothers. We're becoming better disciples. We're becoming better leaders. We are becoming greater testimonies and witnesses of the grace of God. And if I could say anything to you at the beginning here, it would be that your understanding would be, would be shaped by the reality that there is a testimony to your life. That your life is a testimony of something. But the reason that you're still alive, the reason you didn't die in that car wreck, the reason you didn't lose your mind is that God is using your life as a testimony of something. <coughs> There's something about you that witnesses, something about you that speaks, something about you that, that projects the hope and the mercy of God. There's a story to tell about who you are. And that's what God is doing in your life. And I know everybody doesn't believe this, and that's okay. And I'm not trying to enforce what my conviction is. But I believe that you will live on this earth until God is finished with that story. Amen. In fact, if you were to hear that something had happened to me and I died in some of the many travels I'm in, you could just go ahead and safely assume that God was finished with me. That God is protecting our lives and preserving us in order to fulfill his higher purpose in us. And when that is done, we're going home. It's the way I believe. It's the way that I live. I don't have fear about what will happen simply because I believe I'm going to live as long as God wants me to live in order to fulfill his purpose. Peter wants these people to know that they are not defined by their pre present circumstance. They are not defined by the labels that so often have been placed on our lives to remind us of where we have been. I'm sorry that some of you have encountered and lived through the nightmares of your early days. <coughs> I was talking with a young man not too long ago in our community who suffered the abuse from a family member that should never have happened. And it's marked his life and he struggles to overcome it. And if you're not careful, you can somehow get trapped in that where you're always living your life in the rearview mirror. You're always living in response to what happened to you. But here's the message this morning. The message is that Jesus Christ has saved you. 
And he has redeemed you. And because he did, he gave you a new purpose. Yeah. And he gave you a new destiny and a new future that is not defined by where you've been, but is always defined by where you've been. But you can live your life looking behind you, or you can live your life in the way that God's designed. Because God is not concerned about where you've been as much as he is concerned about where you're going. That's what God's talking to you about. Now the devil's talking to you about where you've been. He's reminding you of everything you've ever done, but God's not doing that. God's not concerned about where you've been. He's concerned about where you're going. He's trying to get you ready for the future. He's trying to help you navigate wherever you are so that you don't get off track and you stay on track to get to where God wants you to be. This passage, Peter just opens up and begins to talk to the people and said, you need to remember who you actually are. You're not what your, your ex says you are. You're not what the doctor said you are. You're not what your enemies say you are. You are who God says that you are. Yes. And here's what Peter says God says you are. He says, first of all, you're chosen. Yes. You are chosen. You are a people that have been chosen. That John 15 and 16 says, you did not choose me. I chose you. Amen. You're chosen. Yes. And, and, and there's something about being chosen. Yes. Something about being picked. We, we didn't find the Lord. He found us. Now, now, I know how we do that. We tell people, you know, I found the Lord. No, we didn't. Mm -hmm. You couldn't find the Lord if he wouldn't, didn't let you find him. It's kind of like when you play hide and seek with your children. You know, and they would go hide and you'd find them real quick. And now it's your turn, Daddy. And you'd go hide. They couldn't find you in a month of Sundays if you didn't let them help. You didn't help them find you. You'd stick your leg out. You'd poke your elbow out there. And all of a sudden, they'd say, I found you. No, they didn't. You let yourself be found. That's the way God did. He let you find him. He gave you faith. He caused the message to come. He opened up your understanding. And you realized that you needed a Savior. And he picked you. He chose you. Now, some people stumble on this. They struggle with it. This idea of how that God chose us, how that God selected us. And when you think about the nation of Israel, for example, and this is what Peter is trying to, to, to project here. He said God did not choose them because they were the biggest or the smartest or the most. It was God's love and his mercy that allowed him to choose them. And that's the way it is with us. God didn't pick us because we're the smartest. He didn't pick us because we're the best. He picked us because he chose to. He made an intentional, conscious decision to allow you to find him and be born again because he chose you. You know, something that we struggle with a lot of times is this idea that God is fair. You will not find that in the Bible. God is not fair. God is just. God is holy. God is sovereign. But the Bible didn't say God was fair. Because what God has done in you is he has chosen you, given you the opportunity to choose him, to accept him. He's given you that privilege. He chose you. He made that decision that he would give you the opportunity to come to salvation. And through Jesus Christ, you accepted him and you became a chosen people. Second thing that he says about you, he said, not only are you chosen, but he said, you are the priesthood. You are priest. In the King James, it says you're a royal priesthood. Yeah. Now, the language can be confusing when you think about it, because if you grew up, for example, in the Catholic movement or the Catholic church, you understand a concept about priesthood that is not exactly what he's talking about here. If you go back in the Old Testament, what you discover is that sin separated God from man. And because it did, man did not have the relationship with God that was intended the day that man was created. That sin put a, a distance between God and man. And so what God did is God set up a system whereby once a year you could go to the temple and you could bring an offering to God. 
And depending on what you were able to give, you could bring a lamb or you could bring a goat. Or you could, if you were poor, you could bring a pigeon or a turtle dove, and you would give it to a priest, a representative of the tribe of Levi. They would take your offering. They would go to the altar, to the Holy of Holies. They would offer a sacrifice to God in your behalf. They would ask God to forgive your sins. And God would forgive your sin because of the sacrifice and the intercession of the priest. Well, when Jesus came, that all changed. Because Jesus became our priest. He became our intercessor. He became the one who was the go-between between God the Father and us. And it was because of Jesus that we now have access. Our sin separated us, but Jesus spanned the gulf and he brought us into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And he made us, Peter said, because of that, he made us to be priests. Now, if <laughs> Get confused there. He's not saying that you are a professional clergyman. That's not what he's saying. You don't need to find the nearest monastery and sign up. That's not what he's saying. He's talking about the work of intercession. He's talking about your relationship to those who do not know Christ. He's talking about that intercession between God and man where you as a believer become his representative to a lost and dying world. This testimony of your life, this intercession that becomes a part of who you are, letting this world know that there is hope in Jesus Christ. You're a priest on your job. You're a priest in your house. You're a priest in your neighborhood. You become God's representative. You become that person who, represent, who represents who God is to the world that does not yet know Jesus Christ. He says not only are you chosen and a priest, but he says you are holy. You are a holy nation. He's a holy God. Everybody say holy. Holy. God is holy. Well, what that simply means is that God is pure. And he's righteous. And he's just. And he says, because I'm holy, I want you to be holy. Well, the challenge for us then is that as human beings, we have a sin nature that is always in battle with us. Our sins have been forgiven. The blood of Jesus Christ has made us clean. But we're always dealing with the challenges of living in a world that is cursed by sin. Right. So what God has provided is the means by which we are sanctified. Yeah. What it simply means we are set apart. Yeah. Yeah. We are made to be God's people. We are constantly working to get closer to God. To live our life in alignment to be the people of God that he wants us to be. And God expects us to live holy lives. He expects as a result of our salvation. Now, let me see if I can explain it this way. When God saved you, he forgave you of your sins. Yeah. But in forgiving you of your sins, he didn't take you away from all the temptations that you face. Right. Right. He didn't take you away from the fact that you have a proclivity to do wrong. That you have to bring that under control. You have to bring your flesh under control. That process is what the old timers called sanctification. Yeah. And it happens three ways. It happens by the word of God, knowing the word of God, hearing the word of God, allowing the word of God to speak into your heart. It happens by the blood of Jesus Christ, which the Bible said cleanses us from all sin. Now listen, when you got saved, you became a new creature. You weren't the person that you were after you gave your heart to God. If you're sitting here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ, the very moment that you confess your sins, the Bible said according to 2 Corinthians, that you become a new creature. Old things pass away. All things become new. You become saved and redeemed because God has forgiven you. But you're still a human being. If somebody spits in your face, hmm. you may have a battle on your hands. <laughs> My grand, my old granddad used to tell the story about two guys going to a tent meeting one night. And one of them said, Elijah, I believe I'm so sanctified if a man spit in my face, I could put my arms around him and hug him. Hmm. And Elijah went, <laughs> <laughs> Just took his fist and cold cocked Elijah right into the song. 
He's helping him out. He said, I'm sorry, buddy. I don't guess I'm as sanctified as I thought I was. <laughs> you are still a human being. You've still got to deal with the challenges of life. You're still going to be tempted by some of the same things that you were tempted by. So then how do you do that? You are you become sanctified by allowing God to help you deal with those situations and allowing the Holy Spirit to help you to become holy. Now, you, you're not holy on your own. You're not holy because you keep a set of rules. You're not holy because you keep the Ten Commandments. You are holy because the blood of Jesus Christ makes you holy. He justifies you in the sight of God, and he makes you to be holy. And then every day of your life, you are working with God to be a holy person. You are setting yourself apart from this world. You're no longer chasing the things that you once chased. You're no longer going for the things that you once went for. Because your heart now is after God. Your heart belongs to God. And because you want God, you want the things of God. Can I just say this? One of the challenges that we have in this world is that some of us who say that we are saved are still wanting to live out there in the world. Peter said, that's not the way it is. You've been called, he said, you've been called out of darkness into a marvelous light in order that you can show forth the praises of him who called you. I just say this with great humility. But if you've given your heart to the to Lord Jesus Christ and you're still doing the same things that you did before you got saved, you need to come back. You need to come back. You didn't get there yet. Because there's something on the inside of you that no longer wants the things that I formerly wanted. I don't want to do that anymore. My spirit is turned in a different direction. And the Holy Spirit inside of me is helping me every day to not do the things that I don't need to do so that my relationship with God stays the same. I'll say more about that in a minute. Let's go to number four. Number four, he says, you are God's possession. Now, if you use a King James Bible, it says that you are peculiar. That always bothered me. Because I think peculiar means weird. God's not saying that you're weird. This language here is better. I like it better in the New Living. It says that you are a people of God's possession. It means that you belong to God. You are God's people. You are the people of God. He even says there once was a time when you were not God's people. But now you are the people of God. That's why the atmosphere in this room is the way that it is because we are the people of God. We belong to God. We are his, and we are his possession. And we've been set apart in that regard. We've been set apart as God's possession. Next slide, guys. Pay, up, stay attention here. Pay attention. We, we have been made to be God's possession. And because we are God's possession, we are set apart for his glory and for his honor. Amen. Amen. Let me see if I can help you understand this. I belong to Shelly. She picked me. <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> I'm not sure she had a better option, but she picked me. That makes me special. She could have married a plumber from West Virginia, she wanted to. but she picked me. That's not to say the plumbers in West Virginia are not good people. They are. But I'm simply saying there's something special about knowing that I have been set apart because she chose me. In the same way, I belong to God and I am set apart from the world because he chose me. He put his name on me. He put his branding on me. I belong to the Lord. I'm his possession. I belong to him. Number five, he says, you are a people who have received mercy. He said, there once was a time when you had not gotten mercy. You didn't have mercy, but you now have received mercy. We've talked a lot about mercy here in the last several months, and I hope that you're getting the point. 
that none of us in this room deserve what we got from God. There's none of us that are righteous. None of us. None of us that are perfect. None of us that have it all together. We daily, we constantly need the mercy of God. It's God's mercy that is at work. It's the testimony of my life. You may not know where I've been, but I can just tell you, I got here by mercy. I didn't get here by my talent. I didn't get here by my name. I got here by the mercy of God. <laughs> Two years ago, I was invited to a meeting and I was sitting there in that meeting and there was a speaker that night that spoke on the mercy of God. Never forgotten that message. He, he preached about the mercy out of the mercy seed and what the mercy meant. And, and somewhere in that, in that message, and I'm not here to imply that this was some sort of a hocus pocus something. I'm clearly convinced that this minister knew the person that he was going to get. He just walked out in the audience and had this man stand up and he put a microphone in his hand. He said, tell this group what it was like the night God saved you. Well, I knew the man. Didn't know him well, but I knew him. I knew enough about him to know that he pastored the church in our state, in our region. And that man began to tell his story. He said, the night that God saved me, he said, I was a Vietnam veteran that had come home addicted to vodka and heroin. And he said, my life was a mess. He said, I, I was such a wreck. He said, I, he said, I stunk because I never took a bath. I, didn't, I just never did that kind of stuff. He said, I didn't get my hair cut. I didn't trim my beard. He said, I look like a hoodlum. He said, I just, I just look horrible. I smelled horrible. He said, I couldn't keep my life together. I couldn't keep a job because I couldn't stay sober. He said, I kept getting drunk. I kept getting high. I'd get fired from that job. I'd get another job and on about my whole life. He said, one day after I'd gotten fired from my job, I was driving my truck back to the house and I thought, I told my wife, I said, when you and the kids, when you and the kids leave to go to church, Tonight, I'm going to drive my pickup truck down in the woods as far as I can drive it. <clears throat> and I'm going to kill myself. Don't tell the children where I've gone. Just let me be under and rot. Don't need to have a funeral. Don't do it. Just let me just rot down there. I don't want to live this way anymore. I don't have any desire. I can't keep living this way. I'm so miserable. He said his wife was completely calm. And she said, well, Danny... If you've made up your mind that you're going to kill yourself, I just got one request. Why don't you go to church with your family one more time, and then you can always kill yourself after church. <laughs> he said, I was so drunk, that makes sense to me. <laughs> he said, so I gathered the family up, and we drove down to the church. He said, the family went in. He said, I went in. I sat down on the back seat of that little church. And he said, I promise you, when I sat down back there, he said, the Holy Ghost came back there and sat down beside me. He said, I couldn't tell you what the man preached. I couldn't tell you who sang. I couldn't tell you anything because I kept hearing this voice in my head that was saying, Danny, if you'll, get, if you'll just give me a chance. If you'll just give me your life, I'll turn you around. I'll make something out of your life. He said, I could hardly wait when the invitation came. He said, I ran down to that altar. He said, I gave my heart to Christ. I confessed my sins. God saved me that night. God filled me with the Holy Spirit. He said, I went home and I took a bath, the first bath I'd had in weeks. He said, I shaved and cleaned up, got my hair cut, bought a brand new suit, went back to church on Sunday morning, and they gave me a visitor's card. <laughs> they didn't even know who I was. I said, folks, I'm the guy that got saved on Wednesday night. They didn't even recognize me. And all the, the audience I was with that night, you know, we're on our feet, we're shouting, we're praising God. What a testimony. Hallelujah. Two thoughts went through my head just like that. I mean, two thoughts immediately went through my head. The first thought that went through my head was this. I know some churches where that old boy would have never got in the door that Wednesday night. Amen. You hear what I'm telling you? They would have stopped him at the door and told him, you don't fit in with our church. You don't look like what we're looking for. You go home and shave that beard. You get that hair cut. You can take a bath. You come back. Maybe we'll take you. And a man could have gone into eternity lost without God. You understand what I'm saying? I'm telling you somehow God has to change our mind to help us understand this isn't a house for people that have it all together. This is a house full of people who have the undeserved mercy of God. We're not here because we deserve it. It's His mercy. God's mercy. If you're 
trying to decide about Lake Erie and you don't know whether you should be here or not, let me tell you this. This church will not have rules that keep sinners out. This church will not have atmosphere that keeps lost people out. No matter who you are, whosoever will, let them come. And church will come. Let them free from the mountain of life. Let it be said that this is a house of mercy. Mercy that was great and that was free. Heart of the Lord of the Pride to me. Tear my burden so it's found liberty. God, help us to be a church of mercy. Help us to be a church of mercy. One of us sometimes. what some of us have happened. We forgot what we were like when the Lord saved us. We think we showed up in a pristine set. I'm telling you, we were as rotten and nasty as any other sinner in the world. That was the second thought in my head. Because I grew up in a pastor's home. I've been in church all my life. When I heard about that man's testimony, I thought, well, that's remarkable. I'm glad I never did any of that stuff. The moment, I, the, the moment that thought came in my head, I felt God say, listen, you may not have looked like that on the outside, but you were just as nasty on the inside. Because I don't care where you came from. I don't care what part of town you grew up in. I don't care who your mama or your daddy is. I don't care what your bank accounts say. When you don't have Jesus Christ, you are lost. You are lost and you need the mercy of God. You need forgiveness. You need grace and mercy to be applied to your heart. And I want to be a part of a church that is a house of mercy for lost people. He said, you once received mercy. You once did not have mercy, but now you have received mercy. I'm so grateful for the mercy of God. Amen. So I was wrapping this up a couple weeks ago, looking over this list, and I'm thinking, okay, here's five things that Peter says we ought to be. And on my paper, I wrote this word, these two words. So what? When you're sitting here this morning, you're hearing all this excitement, and you're thinking, this ain't going to bring my husband back to me. This ain't going to pay my bills this week. It's not going to make a difference with my kids. It's not going to bring my daughter home, is it? So what? All of these things I'm supposed to be, all the stuff I'm supposed to do, what God's trying to do in me. What about the stuff that I'm dealing What does it mean in the everyday life of the way that I live? If you just keep reading, Peter says, he said, you got to do a couple things. He said, the first thing you got to do, you got to live a clean life. You want to change the atmosphere where you are? You want to change the environment of your life? You want to put the broken pieces of your life together? Live a clean life. I've grown up through four or five decades of the church. Some of you have as well, and I've seen the way the pendulum has swung. My grandfather, who was a pastor, used to tell me stories over ranking of when, when he was first saved at the church, they wouldn't let you chew chewing gum. Because it made it look like you were chewing tobacco. And it was damaging to your wings. They wouldn't let you drink Coca-Colas out of a can. Because that's how beer was processed and somebody see you drinking a Coke out of a can, they might think you were drinking beer and your testimony would be compromised. It was a it was a fanatical legalism. I wouldn't sit here and make fun of it if we want, but what it was is these people were so desirous to live a holy and sanctified life that they just went too far. The pendulum swung over here to a fanaticism that made the gospel hard. Yeah. People were, were embarrassed and made fun of and, and ridiculed and, and kept away from the church and made them feel like that they would never be worthy to come to church. And then over the years, the pendulum started swinging back the other way. 
You can call me an old fogey if you want to, but it feels like we're over here now where nothing matters. That's right. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. You can handle the word of God in any old way you want to. You can sit on, stand on the platform and sing the songs of God and live like the devil all week long. I'm telling you, you better start living a clean life. If you want God's anointing, if you want God's favor in your life, if you want the blessings of God, if you're trying to change the order of your life, you have to start living a clean life. And so I said to the Lord, I said, Lord, help me to say this in the right way. And it's so beautifully how the Lord seemed to speak this into my heart that, that what I'm trying to say to you is not some legalism of rules and regulations. These things I don't do anymore. I don't do them because I'm afraid of God. I do them because I want Him. I want Him. Joy Rivers, I want Him in my life. I want the anointing of God. John such I want the favor of God. And so I want to live in a way that nothing separates me from God. The things of this world. The things that people say, well, I, I, want to, I want to live my own life. Well, then you can't have the anointing. You can't have the favor of God and live your own life. Paul said it this way, the life that I live, I live by faith in the Son of God who gave himself for me. And it's not I that live, but it's Christ who lives in me. So there may be something that I could do if I wanted to, but I don't do it because I don't want anything to hinder the flow of God's life. And I'm not here telling you what you have to do. I'm not here trying to work out your salvation or hold some Ten Commandment rule or read a book over your head. I'm just telling you that if you want Him, if you want His presence, if you want His power, if you want His anointing, if you want the glory of God, you have to live a clean life. And I say this because I love you, because I'm your pastor. You've got to quit trying to live so close to the world and hold on to God. You can't serve two masters. You gotta walk away from what you formerly have. You gotta move yourself away from the things of this world so that God's presence can work in your life. Amen. Live a clean life. Amen. Amen. He goes on to say in that next same passage, he says, Don't live in a way that causes people to slander. Don't leave any room for slander. We've talked about this, so I won't belabor the point. Just in case you haven't been here in the last few weeks, you're carrying the name of Jesus when you walk out of here. Everywhere you go, you carry the name and the reputation of Jesus Christ. So if you go out here and act like the devil, please don't tell him you go to our church. <laughs> I once had a lady in my church years ago. She came into our church and her family had great need. And we helped her. And I had a woman in my church who, who worked for a governmental service that would provide housing for the poor. It was a Section 8 program. And so she was able to get Section 8 housing for this family. The only thing they had to do was mow their grass. That's all they had to do. Just mow the grass. They were so lazy they wouldn't mow the grass. And they got kicked out. I was sitting in my office one day, and the lady in my church called. She said, Pastor, you probably need to get down here. I said, what's the matter? She called one day. She said, they're down here, and they're creating a, a ruckus. I said, what's going on? She said, well, they've been kicked out of their house simply because they won't mow their grass. They've been cited four times. They will not mow their grass. They've been kicked out. And I thought she wanted me to come mow the grass. I said, well, what do you want me to do? She said, I think you need to get down here because she's invoking your name and telling everybody that you're her pastor and you're going to come down here and clean out City Hall. <laughs> she told him, she said, well, my pastor, my pastor finds out what you've done to me, he'll come down here and have all of your jobs. I said, Lucille, I want you to hang up this phone right now. I want you to walk down there to your supervisor and tell her I don't endorse anything that woman said. <laughs> Nothing. I just barely know her. And what I know about her won't help her. She said, thank you, Pastor. That's why I called you, because I wanted to be able to say, I just talked to my pastor, and he's not on board with this. He 
You know, say, listen, why don't you live a life that honors God in such a way that when people want to talk about you, they can. Because you live such a good life. The reputation of Jesus is in your pocket. The message of hope is in your pocket. And you carry it with you everywhere you go. Don't leave room for slander, Peter said. Live in a way that honors God. I love what, what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, let your light so shine before men that they will see your good works and they will glorify the Father. Yeah. Go something like this. You leave that conversation. You leave that encounter in such a positive way that when you walk away, that person behind you says, thank God for that guy. Thank God for that person. One night I was coming home from a revival meeting that I was preaching many, many years ago. And uh, I pulled into a service station and I got my credit card out to pump the gas and it wouldn't read the card. So I went into the store, had the man turn the pump on and I pumped my gas and I went back in the store so that he could take my card. The young man that night was late. He said, sir, he said, uh, I'm not able to electronically take your card. I'll have to use one of these old-fashioned swipers. You know, when you put it down, you put the card over it, you swipe it over, you know. I said, fine. That's fine. I paid for my gas, $33. And I went home. A couple weeks passed by, and I'm sitting in my office, and the phone rang, and a very polite woman said, uh, Mr. Isaacs, uh, I'm calling you from the Phillips 66 corporate office. Our security and fraud division. Do you have your credit card with you? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, would you get it out? I said, sure, get it out. She said, would you read me the number? I better read the number. She said, would it surprise you to find out that over $800 in gas and groceries have been charged in the car in the last 24 hours? I said, it sure would. And she said, $600 the day before? She said, we wondered if maybe you had a fleet of cars. I said, no, ma'am, just the one. She said, well, then somebody has stolen your car. Oh, so if you've been through that, you know how that goes. They put the shoe in the car, they put the hole in that car, you're not, working, you're not responsible for the charges. My business. And, and she said to me, she said, if anybody calls you, because there's a number, of, a number of establishments in the area that have been affected, if anybody calls you, just refer them to the local sheriff's department. Okay. So a couple of days passed by and I came home and my wife said, hey, there's a guy here to call me. He's irate. He needs you to call him. So I called him. Right off the bat, man, it was confrontational. You ripped me off. I said, who is he? And he gave me the name. He said, I run this little service station over here. And he said, you came into my store, you used your credit card, you bought groceries and gas, and you ripped me off. I said, no, I didn't. And I went through the whole diatribe. I told him the whole thing. He got real quiet and he said, well, I bet you're a preacher. <laughs> I said, why do you say that? He said, because all of my life, preachers have been ripping me off. <laughs> I said, where did you say this store was? I said, will you be there tomorrow? He said, yeah. He said, why do you ask? I said, because I'm coming down there. 